Uh, one of the hardest things uh, for uh, pastors is to say goodbye in the way that is important, uh, which is that goodbye means goodbye. Um, it is so very difficult because uh, clearly pastors uh, have made very, very significant relationships with many people in the congregations and have been through some very important life transitions, baptisms, weddings, funerals, uh, uh, personal crises, uh, uh, perhaps even social uh, realities uh, with uh, members of the congregation. But the reality of that is, is, is they came into those relationships because they were the pastor of the church. And they will no longer be the pastor of the church. And this is a very uh, difficult reality because we're, we're the same people, but we really aren't. The, 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 uh, the way in which we relate to people is because we were introduced into that relationship because of um, uh, the authority and the care that we have. And it's invested, the hard part about it is, it's invested in us as people, not just as positions. Uh, and that's important. So the way in which we say goodbye, and staff parish relations committees can help this, and it is a good place to, to begin, is that that's what it means. Goodbye means goodbye. And it's important to say that and not to be coy. Because as Jesus was talking about this, you know, the reality is you can't hold on. You can't hold on. And having been through this myself on, on uh, five occasions, I know what the questions are. But you will come back to visit, won't you? As what? And, and it, it, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to say, but the answer is no, I can't do that. I can't do that. And new religion, because this is not about you, it's about the church and how it moves forward. And if I'm invited back to go to a church, I'm its past, I'm not its future. And I know that very clearly. I did go, I was invited back to a church um, that I had served when I was in seminary. And, and I was in seminary back um, uh, when there was no King James Version. It was, <laughs> It's a long time ago. A long time ago. And in the, in the city where I was serving, there were 14 United Methodist churches uh, at the time. And uh, it was also the city I grew up in, where my wife grew up. And so I was serving a city, uh, or I was serving a church, except on the other side of the city where I had to change from being an English high school bulldog to whatever it's high school, high school's uh, mascot was. You can tell it's hard for me to do, but I accomplished it. So that was important. Well, I came up to the seminary, and this is 20 years later, and one of the folks from the Northern Illinois Conference was moved to New England where her parents lived, and two years later invited me to come back to preach at Advent. 14 United Methodist churches have now become one. Right. And it was announced, of course, that I was coming. I have more yellow news clippings of the glory days of the Methodists in that city that were brought and given to me. Do you remember when this happened? Do you remember when this happened? Do you remember when, oh, they were the glory days. They've been through difficult times. And after the worship service, uh, I went into the pastor's study, who, who was a colleague of mine from Northern Illinois, and she said, Mark, where was the hockey rink? I said, oh, it's, it's about three blocks from here. Will you take me to the hockey rink and show me? Because they talk about the hockey rink all the time. I think I blushed because my wife and I dated at that hockey rink. <laughs> so I said, sure, anything else you want to see? She had a list of about six places that were really important. So we drove down. So the hockey rink is, wow, it's a jewel Oscar. <laughs> so this must be brand new. This was in 
2009, we got out so new that the plaque read 1983. <laughs> That's why you have to say goodbye. Because the reality is that as pastor, you see, you become an anchor and don't let the church move forward. And that's, that's very, very hard to do. And you have to be open. Uh, if there's an invitation from the one who uh, is the new pastor for you to come back, and you cannot be pressured into that, or coy uh, for good reasons, that that may be possible, but it must be carefully chosen. I left another church and uh, uh, moved about 12 miles away. Some of you are moving those, those uh, short distances away. And uh, this was a church of, of basically middle-aged folks. Not many people died there. They probably had four, four or five uh, uh, funerals a year because folks would move in for their professional lives and they would move out uh, afterwards. They had a lot of baptisms and nobody died. Now, the district superintendent called me one day and said, how do you do that? <laughs> he said, call Florida, they'll tell you. So the first death happened, uh, and, and the pastor called and said, well, you know, it's difficult. This was a member of the church, and uh, her daughter died of uh, a heroin overdose, and I had been working uh, uh, when I was pastor there, and he had not gotten to meet her yet. So I said, sure, I'll go back. Um, and I did it with him. I mean, he was the, and I just gave the eulogy and, and the final blessing. Uh, and then about three months later, he called again. And he said, would you come back? I said, well, I can't. I mean, I had a funeral of my own. I moved to the church that had about 100 funerals. 100 funerals a year. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. About 100 funerals a year. Uh, and, and I had one that day. And I said, I can't come. And about three months later, I get another call. And he said, can you, can you come and, and do a funeral? I realized he didn't like doing funerals. <laughs> There's a place at which this is about where God is leading the church into, a, into the future. It's very, very hard. Very hard. Uh, but, but it's important. As pastors, we must be clear about a boundary. We must be clear about the boundary to say no. And that's extraordinarily difficult, especially if you work so closely with one another. Very difficult. Because, again, this is about a future of the church. And you know vanity gets in our way. My successors were never as good as I was. <laughs> <laughs> Even if the statistical reports proved it different. <laughs> so we have to care about, about that as well. Because this, at this moment, is not about us. It's about the church of Jesus Christ and its witness. And to leave that church empowered for the future. It's really quite critical, hear me again, to leave the church empowered for the future. This isn't just theoretical. This is real. I was in a church, uh, this is the problem, uh, somebody said what I did this the first time, I thought you were an academic, you keep talking about what you actually experienced, and the answer is true. I was in a church and the district superintendent came, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say bad things and really uh, about this, district superintendent came for a charge conference, it was late into the spring, they were doing both charge conferences and appointments uh, in, in the age before sanity set in in the spring. And so this had to be the beginning of April. And the staff parish relations committee, I'd been there for five years, said, is Mark going to be here another year? We're, we're doing you know, great things and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, the district superintendent said, we have absolutely no plans to move him. You can move ahead with your plans, uh, and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Anybody ever had this experience? <laughs> Then came Easter, but they experienced it as Good Friday uh, because on Holy Saturday, the chair of the staff parish relations committee uh, got the call that I knew was coming because I'd been reappointed that Monday. 
And I couldn't say no. Because I'd already had one no a year before, and you know, that was it. <laughs> but let me be clear, I loved where I was. The superintendent had said, he's staying. The easy thing for me as pastor would have been to get up into that pulpit on Easter Sunday of all times and to say, you know what that dirty rotten scoundrel did? <laughs> Because I knew that the question was going to be, Mark, was this your choice? Did we do something wrong? <laughs> As the United Methodist pastor, I have no idea what next year brings. But it was my choice to leave that church when I gave my vows of ordination before the bishop 20 years before. We didn't foresee that particular twist. They thought that everything was set, that I wasn't going to have to move. One of my colleagues who was supposed to go to the church I went to had a heart attack and died. You understand what, what happens? So the reality for all of us is we are, we are part of this connection. We aren't just our local selves or our individual selves. We are part of a greater connection. Now, one could argue that our connection has got some problems. I, I actually teach about those problems. But there is a bond that binds us all, that we respect and support one another's ministry, lay and clergy, and, and that this is uh, an this is important uh, piece. So that is why it's crucial to leave the church and the connection of power. Because if I had thrown my little fit and said, you know what the dirty rotten scoundrel did, can you imagine what would happen when the district superintendent came in the next time to make an appointment? It was going to be bad enough anyway, uh, but if I was opposed to what was going on, it would be uh, difficult. The other thing that's important is that, that the larger community knows I was in another church where every time a Methodist died, my predecessor got the phone call from the funeral director. Why? Because the funeral director thought he did good funerals. I don't really know what that means, folks, but at least that's what I was told. And by the way, he forgot to tell the funeral director that there was a new Methodist preacher in town. They need to know that. The wider community needs to, to know uh, that that's what's going on, okay? Very, very important. In terms of administration, my recommendation is just as you're welcoming somebody new, it's all about relationships and about people to people stuff, please, 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 I, I, I often uh, say, have only the meet, meetings that are absolutely necessary. Like, absolutely necessary. If the church burns down, that may be a necessary meeting. <coughs> Absolutely necessary. Because there's not much more that the current pastor can do if you know that they're moving. I've worked with far too many churches that after the appointments were made, the pastor decides, oh, we need to get a mission and vision statement together. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're, you should already be on to thinking about the next church and saying goodbye to this one. Don't do that stuff. Because the new pastor who comes in is going to read that mission and vision statement as if it was hieroglyphics. They don't understand the heart that birthed it, the leadership that birthed it. So please, 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 this is about saying goodbye. The other thing that, we, that I've learned very much is that pastors are often unsure how they'll be remembered. Best thing to do is simply ask. Don't try to burnish your image in the last two months. Some presidents try to do that. And it doesn't work. I won't name names because then you'll think I'm getting political. <laughs> Don't burnish your image. They'll remember you as they will remember you. Not because of what you told them in the last two months uh, you were going to do. 
So this is not a time to start a capital campaign to build a new sanctuary that nobody knew was supposed to be there. So you feel good. You, you get what I'm saying? Say goodbye. That's hard enough. All that other stuff that we try to do is keeps us from that real hard work of saying goodbye. The other piece is, if, if, unless there are, are really good reasons for this not to happen, an expression of the connection is that at key moments, if you can invite your successor to be present with you at an event. Why? Because it represents the connectional reality. Unfortunately, and, and I will say this, and then, you know, I'm a visiting firefighter, I'll slip back to, uh, uh, no, I'll go really back to Rhode Island and so say you'll never find me uh, there. Far too often, our United Methodist Connection, I, I, I will say this uh, because it was very, really important uh, in my life. As a United Methodist, we are not ordained individually. The bishop ordains us with a group of people. And I was uh, 25 years old, and there were 15 other persons who were ordained with me at that time. And I realized, looking up and down that, that uh, row, that for the next 40 years, we were being charged with the responsibility for the leadership of that annual conference. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we kept up with each other pretty well for the first 15 years out. And I'm in Illinois, and half of them actually have uh, uh, passed on and, and uh, have gone to the Lord. But the notion that we are ordained to be leaders in the whole conference, that's what this symbol is of having your successor and predecessor together at a major event. We care about the church. What we become far too often is that the United Methodist Church simply becomes one more deployment system, which really is not expressive of the connection itself. Really not important. Uh, or not, not who we are. So if you can find a time or, or another to do that, that's real important. Or, uh, and, and I would really urge this, that you invite the, your successor to come to meet with the leadership of the church so that they, they've got something to do uh, to prepare uh, to go. So in the, in the next two months, uh, before you do move, one of the things is to get a true assessment of where the church is. Get the numbers together. Okay? How many members do you have? Really? <laughs> Every church that I've gone to, it's like, it's like the voting rolls in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> oh, you get it, don't you? 10% of the people that vote in Chicago actually are dead. I used to go in the membership role, there would be people who of course were in the statistical tables that, that had gone on to Jesus. You know, I think every United Methodist Annual Conference should have the Jesus Church so that Jesus can help <laughs> those people who have gone home, who really are your members. Because it's really frustrating for me to call, but it was, when I would want to call and visit, and sorry, the phone's been disconnected. How long? Five years. <laughs> Number two, how many people really attend church on Sunday morning? So why do I say that? Because if you say that there are 450 people that attend church on a Sunday morning, and then there's always that first Sunday where the wonder who the new person is, we gotta go and check them out, but only 200 show up for rally day in the fall, guess what that's going to do to your, to your new pastor? What? Over the summer, you figured out how to get rid of half the congregation? <laughs> what have I done? You've got to be realistic about that. Who's in nursing homes? How do they get cared for? What is our financial health? All that kind of thing. Very, very important. 
that kind of truth telling and, and uh, uh, that kind of thing is, is very important for, for us to do uh, at that point. During the transition, one of the things I would also say is very important is if the pastor is no longer there, the major question that we said is, who is this church without the pastor? The other question is, who is we? There's a transition team. At which church is this? Oregon. Oregon. Is that true throughout the conference now? Right. is, is a, a transition team is not a bad idea at all. Because the question is, where is the strength of the laity to lead during this period of time? To care for the congregation in this, how do we say goodbye and how do we say hello? Which is not just what the staff parish committee does, but it's what the whole congregation does. So it's not a bad idea at all. Because it, it does talk about the strength of uh, the laity. And, and that should uh, emerge. So if you've got a transition team, uh, that would be very helpful.